Democracy Forum brings you another not to be missed webinar. Extremism and Radicalization in Central Asia While extremism and radicalization have a global impact, in Central Asia they are largely cross-border phenomena. Many extremist organizations that operate in the region stem from Afghanistan, due to the presence of the Taliban and previously, Al-Qaeda militants. Others come from the Fergana Valley as a result of the Tajik Civil War. Following the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, many observers highlighted the potentially explosive nature of the region. To consider these and related issues, please tune into our live broadcast for a stimulating discussion, bringing your questions and comments for the panel. Hello and welcome. I'm Humphrey Hawksley, your host for our Democracy Forum debate today on a region and an issue that amid the maelstrom of today's upheavals is too often overlooked. We plan to change that by examining Central Asia, an area loosely termed by some as the Stans, former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and a swathe of area that also goes outside that, a vast territory, a crossroads mingling the trade, the ideas, and the cultures of Europe and Asia. The Silk Road, the great game, that 19th century struggle between Britain and Russia. What were the stakes then and what now? And how do the factors of extremism and radicalization impacting so much of our world, how is that unfolding in Central Asia? To explain the region and address the issue, extremism and radicalization in Central Asia, we have a brilliant panel. Anna Matviva, Dr. Emil Nazritinov, Edward Lemon, John Heathershaw, Thomas F. Lynch. Democracy Forum Chair Barry Gardner is following our debate and is deeply knowledgeable about the issues that we're discussing. He will sum up at the end. And as always, to give us the canvas and the background of our discussion, we go to the president of the Democracy Forum, Lord Charles Bruce. Lord Bruce, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, which is being held to explore the link between religious extremism and radicalization in Central Asia. It's timely and appropriate that the team at Democracy Forum has selected this topic, which draws our attention to a part of Asia not often featured in our webinar series. I'm delighted that we're able to call on such a distinguished panel to discuss the issues in the context of improving governance, respect for human rights, and the development of civil society across Central Asia. And I'm very grateful to Humphrey Hawksley for taking the role of chair. The revival of Islam in Central Asia was one of the many unforeseen consequences of the collapse of the USSR in 1991. Research published recently by Foreign Policy Center tracing the impact both colonial and post-colonial of the Soviet era on Central Asia since 1923 suggests that, I quote, the rebirth of Islam in the region creates new risks while new connections with the Islamic world have brought more extreme interpretations of the faith from abroad. In this regard, radical Islamist activism is perceived as a serious threat to the internal stability and the survival of Central Asian secular regimes. Or in the words of the French political scientist Olivier Roy, I quote, terrorism does not arise from the radicalization of Islam but from the Islamicization of radicalization. And testimony pro provided by the Carnegie Endowment for World Peace to United States Congress, the House Committee on International Relations, further exposes the nature of the terrorist threat 
and the re regime response, where I quote, Central Asian leaders have not taken pains to distinguish between religious activists, religious extremists, and Islamic terrorists, where anyone who advocates the primacy of religious values over secular norms is understood to be an enemy of the state, whether or not this primacy is to be achieved through persuasion or through force. Such a view is endorsed by Fiona Hill, a former White House advisor on Central Asia, who also presented her findings to Congress, emphasizing that, I quote, harsh government repression of dissent is as much, if not more, of a threat to Central Asian stability as the radical Islamic movements that have developed indigenously, indigenously or moved into the region. The consequences of these anti-terrorist activities have been closely monitored by Human Rights Watch, which regularly expresses concern for the deliberately unclear definition of extremism used by the authorities to restrict rights to freedom of religion, expression, and association. The conflation of legitimate political dissent, religious adherence, and terrorism is a feature of all the Central Asian sovereign states under discussion today. Several are already designated as either countries of particular concern for being among the world's worst violators of religious freedom, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, or recommended for inclusion in a special watch list for engaging in or tolerating severe violations of religious freedom, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan by the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Is it possible to conclude, therefore, that the terrorist threat has been manipulated and exaggerated by state actors to pursue strategic domestic policies and increase regime legitimacy? If this is the case, then perhaps we really need to consider the contested and political nature of terrorism in Central Asia. Well, welcome to the webinar and hope you enjoy listening to the proceedings today. And if you have any questions or comments, please pass them to the panel through the chair. Lord Charles Bruce, thank you very much for that. Unclear definitions. There are countries of concern that is the terrorist threat exaggerated or perhaps are not flagged up enough. We will find out. Our first panelist is Dr. Anna Madviva from King's College London, who has lived in Central Asia in her capacity mainly as a UN Development Programme Regional Advisor on Peace and Development. Her field experience includes all five of those Central Asian countries that I named just now, together with other places like Syria, Ukraine, Myanmar, Ghana. In fact, you name it, and the chances are our first panelist here has worked there in these uh, unstable conflict zones. How much do the people of Cent are the people of Central Asia part of the international terrorist movements abroad, and whether that threat of domestic radicalization that we just heard about is dead or dormant? Dr. Anna Matviva, tell us what you know. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can now. Thank you, Anna. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I did live in uh, Central Asia working for the United Nations as the UNDP Peace and Development Advisor. And I also have uh, worked for the UN in Syria. So my comments are based on uh, ground research, both in Central Asia and in Syria, where I did encounter um, individuals who have be, been involved in violent extremism, uh, some of them in terrorism, and also their families who have been brought from Central Asia uh, to Syria and ended up in Al Holka. Um, I also studied and uh, worked on international programs um, which tackle uh, this issue, so there will be questions we can discuss that. So my findings are that uh, data largely doesn't confirm that are overwhelmingly poor and unemployed individuals join um, such movements because there are plenty of examples to the contrary of quite well-to-do and educated individuals from elite circles are also uh, 
get involved and more often than the poor and marginalized. Uh, radicalization is not uh, directly related to material factors. They only uh, play in combination with others to form an attractive pass package. Uh, also, data does not confirm uh, the immaturity thesis because um, most of people who get involved with these movements are over 20, uh, they're married, uh, quite often with children, they're well integrated in the community, and uh, more often than not, uh, the whole extended families uh, migrated to uh, the Middle East and now more recently to Afghanistan. We also need to distinguish uh, maybe degrees of radicalization and have a more nuanced picture. Uh, there are quite a lot of confused individuals who wanted to come, become heroes, uh, who has succumbed to a peer pressure, and they quite often made the bulk of those who are returned from Central Asia back to their um, countries, being disillusioned and being, uh, frankly speaking, very frightened. But there are also uh, so much believers are uh, very committed, and uh, they they also do exist. They are real people. Um, so um, why Central Asia are important on kind of a big scheme of things if we talk about uh, international uh, terrorist um, movements? Um, first, disproportionately to the population of the uh, five states of Central Asia, uh, at least 5,000 known individuals are joined as uh, foreign fighters. Uh, the figures believed to be much more, but that's something which has been proved. Um, so uh, there is also now um, a trickle uh, going to Afghanistan. Again, these cases are confirmed. Uh, the interesting thing is why people are going to um, Syria and Iraq and some of them to Yemen, which they had a very little prior affinity with. With Afghanistan, you can make a case that it is very you know, cross-border, people are ethnically related, and that's kind of more natural um, process of contagion. In Central Asia, according to my own data, my own interviews with people who lived uh, under the rule of these groups, um, uh, Central Asians have been uh, really stuck in memory of Syrians. Uh, as a very committed, very good warriors, are uh, willing to sacrifice their own lives and also uh, kill many people with excellent combat skills, um, very good technical skills in uh, military engineering, explosive making, as uh, use of sophisticated weapons. So that is something which uh, we can attribute to the education system in Central Asia. And some of them were educated in Russia. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, people who are, are fighting now in Idlib um, have a very kind of ferocious reputation. What the um, community members uh, were telling me that when uh, the Uzbeks came, then the war really started when they were just Arab fighters and Arab. Um, propagandists, uh, it was uh, really just uh, skirmishing and a lot of words. But when these people came, that's when um, it, it all kind of really began. Um, it is also an interesting fact, uh, to, um, which is not that easy to interpret, that uh, Tajik uh, lead by far in the foreign suicide bombers in ISIS. Um, and for, you have to volunteer to become a suicide bomber. Um, uh, the other last perhaps observation is that the areas with a uh, great presence of Central Asian uh, fighters were uh, the last to um, enter reconciliation uh, deals with the Syrian government and also this group of fighters were the last to fight in Baghouz in uh, eastern Syria against the um, uh, US Kurdish coalition. Um, so why Syria uh, it became attractive and what, it, uh, what resonates uh, with Central Asia? Well, post-Soviet routes are uh, kind of quite similar um, systems, uh, crisis of identity, which um, post-Soviet societies experience, and some similar fe features of the uh, Syrian state, circular state, which has a uh, 
also um, religious issues, uh, religious identity uneasily coexisted in the framework of the secular state. Um, so, um, in my view, motivations um, of uh, Central Asians are to do with the nature of the state, which replaced uh, the Soviet Union, which are not based on the right moral values, uh, but are largely based on uh, nationalism, materialism, and consumerism. The Soviet ideology at least talked about some uh, wider moral uh, kind of uh, uh, issues of equality, justice, um, and that, it, that agenda is uh, now largely deficient. Minorities didn't fare very well in the um, new statehood models and have their grievances. Uh, that's why uh, there is disproportionate participation of ethnic Uzbeks from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, borders, closed states, uh, that's something which really contradicts a uh, more kind of open Islamic Ummah, uh, which reject borders, which has kind of community of people, again, fairly similar to the um, kind of Soviet uh, type of uh, um, state model. And what also changed in the 21st century, that aspiration levels have been raised uh, very high, uh, opportunities seemingly oh, expanded, but in reality they were dashed because most people could not satisfy that level of aspiration. So that created a spiritual void and no certainty what is uh, right or wrong, why are radicalized teachings, uh, and some of it uh, leading into violent extremists, offer that kind of uh, moral certainty, a uh, very clear definition of um, what is right, what is wrong, uh, how one should guide, and an emotional comfort. Um, um, for example, Central Asians, many go into labor migration. Certainly they experience dislocation, they experience loneliness. Um, um, yeah, they are not very much integrated. Uh, some of them end up in prisons. Um, drug trafficking is, uh, is a big issue. Alien environment, lack of support system, that kind of create that, that um, sort of grounds where um, uh, these seeds really can be planted. And lastly, the interest in geopolitics, if the world is seen as we are now looking tragically in the crisis in uh, Gaza as a competition between good, good and evil, and they are personified by certain states, that's something which is also become part of that agenda and kind of a global conspiracy, uh, things uh, do uh, matter. But for, for a pathway um, from ra radicalization into joining violent extremist movements, uh, two things um, have to come together. Uh, individuals' psychological features uh, should be present because the, same, the equal sense of vulnerability, injustice, and grievances can affect individuals completely differently. And uh, skilled recruiters should operate. Uh, Central Asia had uh, quite sophisticated networks of um, recruiters, most of them based abroad, um, uh, some of them sp speaking in Central Asian languages, Uzbek, for example, uh, some of them speaking in Russian. Uh, Russian is quite a prominent language of radicalization. Um, so that uh, networks are incredibly adaptive and they managed to rec to draw in a lot of people. Certainly with the um, setbacks, which um, ISIS, um, the uh, HTS in Syria and other terrorist movements have experienced, their financing has been drying up. So we are uh, looking at less prominent uh, recruitment drive, but it is still there and um, uh, the grounds uh, for it to continue are still present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, just before I let you go and, 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 and move on, can you encapsulate this region for us? Um, we've named the five countries. Are the style of government, are they all similar? There's no developed democracy there. Is it mainly Islamic? Uh, just give us a, a nutshell of what we're talking about here. Yes, um, in a broad brush. Uh, five countries of Central Asia are located on the borders of 
China, Russia, Afghanistan, Iran, and uh, the Caspian Sea, they are all Muslim majority states. Um, they are Sunni Muslims. Um, uh, they, um, some of them have quite significant presence of, um, had significant presence of minorities, but only Kazakhstan really has kind of a large minority population. Um, the two of them are incredibly energy rich, uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, um, uh, upper middle income countries, uh, largely owing to the abundance of natural resources and also presence of um, large uh, companies. Um, two countries, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tajikistan, are poorer. Uh, they do not have that much, uh, that many resources. Uh, Tajikistan has experienced very acute uh, civil war uh, at the beginning of 90s within in where uh, Arab Mujahideen who fought in Afghanistan uh, came in to join uh, because part of the opposition to the government was formed on the kind of Islamic crisis. And, and, and just, uh, to, just, sorry, to, to, just to clarify, are they dictatorships? Are they no. corrupt? No, no, I, no, I, yeah, I, I do not want to go into corruption territory because uh, we can only talk about perception of corruption and uh, a perception of corruption in Central Asia are real. That doesn't mean that these countries are more corrupt than maybe some other countries. It may also say that citizens are more demanding in terms of uh, how transparent and accountable leaders should be. A population of Central Asia is overwhelmingly literate. Uh, many people are educated, so uh, they do perceive injustice quite uh, badly. Um, their form of governance is um, formally a democracy. In reality, there are different degrees of um, authoritarianism uh, be uh, developing. Um, countries go in and out of that kind of that transition from democracy to authoritarianism um, uh, to presidents are uh, perhaps presidents for life. Uh, but um, at the same time, in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, there are more openings. Uh, they do cooperate with the European Union, they do cooperate with the United States, and they are generally quite integrated into the global uh, international. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I wanted to give a grounding to our audience that are not familiar with the area of, of what we were talking about. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. And now we move on to Dr. Emil Nazritnov, uh, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the American University of Central Asia, which is based in the Kyrgyz Republic in Bishkek. But he is actually coming to us from Los Angeles in the very early hours of the morning. Uh, Emil, are you still with us? Yes. Um, Humphrey, how are you? Uh, can you hear me? I can. Tell us what you know. Share share your thoughts about degrees of radicalization in Central Asia. Yes. Uh, I apologize for the background. We are on a road trip, and so it's um, uh, this is how I'm connecting. So yeah, I would like to pick up where uh, Anna left, actually, with the um, you know degree of democracy, um, and also specifically in relation to um, religious freedom that we have uh, in five Central Asian countries. Central Asia is a large region, and uh, so what Anna was um, uh, very right to point out is that um, all five countries have a very different political system, different economical situations, and uh, this has a strong effect on how um, religion evolves in the region as well. Uh, so out of uh, five countries, uh, one that really stands out is Kyrgyzstan, that is where I am um, originally from, is where I live and where I teach, where I do most of my research. Uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, stands out as the country with the um, highest degree of uh, religious freedom, um, always had and still um, is, right? and uh, for um, many years this had an um, effect on how the um, situation with radicalization has also evolved. So the research that we uh, conducted um, many years ago, right, um, um, uh, like in, in the prime time of uh, the conflict in ISIS and just passed over this, uh, was showing that uh, the 
all, the one factor that has the strongest effect um, on um, um, vulnerability of young people to uh, engagement with radical and extremist group was um, various forms of um, discrimination, right? Uh, various uh, grievances that they uh, have developed, uh, specifically in relation to how uh, the state treats them or how they are treated on the basis of their ethnicity, of their social status, of uh, etc. Right? And so um, uh, the statistics from engagements of Central Asian groups in um, Syria, right, in the conflict in Iraq and Syria, show that uh, Kyrgyzstan has uh, perhaps the uh, smallest number of um, foreign fighters per population compared to um, all other Central Asian countries, right, compared to Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. And so... Um, like one could ask like what are the reasons for this right and how this is uh, related to the experiences of discrimination says experiences of grievances right and uh, so our research shows right and what my main um, thesis right that um, I've been pushing forward for quite um, a long time now right is that um, the religious freedom um, is uh, is not simply uh, the result of so, so sort of the, the religious freedom uh, creates a space for a large number of um, um, other Islamic uh, groups uh, which are peaceful, which are non-political, which are not radical, which are not extremist. And uh, these groups uh, have... Um, <clears throat> Um, a very positive effect, right, uh, on uh, de-radicalization of Muslim population. Yeah, there is a natural competition between um, these various jamaats that exist in the country if they have the space to function, if they have the space to perform, right, if they're legal. Yeah, and this natural competition, right, um, uh, sort of excludes um, and um, makes a strong uh, force uh, against uh, groups that are radical and extremist. And so if we um, look at um, <coughs> other countries in Central Asia, we can see that um, in all of them, in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, uh, pretty much all um, re religious groups um, are banned, except for the ones that, uh, you know, <coughs> support the um, of officially sanctioned by the states, such as Muftiyat, etc. Right, and uh, because of this, uh, the radical groups pretty much face no competition on the ground. Right, with Kyrgyzstan, it's different. Right, uh, Kyrgyzstan um, <coughs> from the very beginning has a very liberal religious policy, and because of that, over the last three decades, uh, we have a large number of groups that have evolved. Um, on the ground, you know, uh, that are apolitical, that uh, do not have radical extremist uh, agenda, and uh, that are also very active and popular, right? And these groups include um, South Asians, uh, Tablighi Jamaat, uh, Turkish Hizmet, Nurjular, a number of new um, revived uh, Sufi traditions. And so these groups on the ground uh, make a strong competition for radical groups and uh, they pull away a large number of potential Muslims who can become uh, radi who, who can become radicalized um, into this less uh, political, more um, you know, uh, more popular um, uh, forms of Islam. And so Islam in itself, you know, has a very strong potential to fight um, uh, radicalism, to fight extremism. And if uh, these groups are given this space, right, um, then um, it happens naturally. And uh, Kyrgyzstan is a good example for that, right? So I um, am a practicing Muslim myself and I go to the mosque um, every day and I see how uh, this can competition evolves, how this competition happens on the ground and how uh, people um, yeah, uh, have a choice, right? Um, if um, there is, um, you know, if, if there is um, 
uh, if they can see a, a, a number of options that they can pursue, um, and, and they have freedom to do that, right? So then there are two things happen, right? First of all, uh, they don't feel uh, grievances, they don't feel discriminated, they don't feel, um, you know, um, oppressed by the government. Uh, they feel free to practice their religion the way they want it, right? And secondly, yeah, uh, these other groups, uh, again, they. They, they squeeze out the, 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 these um, radical and extremist groups. And so from this perspective, uh, Kyrgyzstan is a very good example of um, how uh, democracy helps uh, prevent radicalization and extremism uh, by giving a space to um, less political uh, and uh, less radical groups uh, that uh, you know create natural competition and work against radicalization. So this is a very simple thesis. Maybe I will just end here, um, give one simple perspective. It's, it's a great thesis, and, and thank you for, 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 for stubbornly coming through and, and, and talking to us on this. Uh, essentially, you're, you're talking about um, the more freedom of religion that there is, or freedom of thought and discussion, the, the more stability and less radicalization there will be. Can I put you a couple of questions that come in from the audience on this? Uh, one is from Den Krogan. Um, is poverty the prime cause of radicalization in Central Asia? And perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, if you could answer that with one from Rashid Ali, can governmental reform across Central Asian republics help stem radicalization in the region? Yes, uh, so poverty is um, not a factor, right? It's not the most important factor. As I said before, um, uh, grievances, right, and experiences of radicalization, experiences of discrimination, experience of injustice, right? Uh, this is what, if everyone is, you know, universally poor, right? If, if everyone has the same conditions, then, um, you know, the poverty is not a factor. Um, so, Kyrgyzstan is a good example for that. So, as uh, Anna said, it's one of the two poorest countries in the region, right? And yet, it did not uh, became uh, become the main producer uh, of um, radical groups. Um, so, yeah, no, this is not the factor. And as for um, uh, the, yeah, as for the policies across the region, so my argument is always the same, right? more religious space, more uh, more religious freedom, right? more um, a liberal religious policy is the answer. And um, working with the groups rather than against um, the groups is the answer. And um, I believe that um, in spite of um, all the economic difficulties Kyr Kyrgyzstan is experiencing, it still serves as an excellent model for other Central Asian states to follow in regards to how to, they can deal with um, radical groups and how they should formulate religious policy. Okay, thank you very much for that. That was very clear. Uh, stay with us if you can. Uh, we are now moving to uh, Dr. Edward Lemon, School of Government and Public Service at the Texas A&M University, but he happens to be in Washington, D.C., uh, he's an expert on post-Soviet Central Asia, on Russia and China, uh, specifically in the light of violent extremism. He speaks Russian and Tajik. He's editor of the book Critical Approaches to Security in Central Asia, and most recently has been researching on Tajikistan, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. And he's going to pinpoint and focus our debate specifically on the threat of terrorism on the Tajik-Afghan border. Edward Lemon, tell us what you know. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Humphrey. Thank you for the invitation to talk about this important topic. I think Tajikistan's often been seen um, as perhaps the country that's one of the most vulnerable in the region to terrorism. Um, if we look at the figures that Anna talked about earlier in terms of the estimates of those who went to Syria and Iraq, on a per capita basis, the country, Tajikistan, has 10 million people. Um, between officially about 2,000, and if we take the figures from the Turkish government of those who were interdicted at the Turkish-Syrian border, or the Turkish-Iraqi border during the uh, conflict there, you know, this figure rises maybe to 4,000. So that makes Tajikistan on a per capita basis the third country in the world behind Tunisia and the Maldives 
in terms of per capita foreign fighter figures in Central Asia. It's the only country that's experienced an attack back in um, 2018 on four tourists in the country that was credibly linked to ISIS. There'd been other attacks in the region that Islamic State had claimed, but in this case, there was um, almost irrefutable evidence that that group was behind this attack. It's also the country with the longest border with Afghanistan, um, just over 1,300 kilometers long, much of it very difficult mountainous terrain um, that historically was a point where um, militants could cross that border, particularly during the country's uh, civil war that was fought between 1992 and 1997. So it's a country that's often been labeled um, as a country that's vulnerable to extremism. But ultimately, I think the country has experienced relatively few terrorist attacks. And as in other countries in the region, really, it's been the counter extremism policies of these governments that has affected a far greater number of people, um, members of um, religious communities, individuals who are uh, journalists or uh, political activists who are accused of extremism and terrorism as a means to crack down on those alternative sources um, of authority and what are perceived as threats to the regional regimes. So ultimately, despite these predictions, we've not seen um, a mass destabilization of the country. We've not seen large amounts of terrorist attacks. And my comments on the Tajik Afghan border will focus on the developments we've seen, particularly since 2021, August 2021, when the Taliban took over Tajikistan. At that time, um, there was a great degree of concern about how this would affect the broader region. There was concern about uh, mass spillover of refugees. There was concern about um, a um, conflicts spilling over into Central Asia. Um, and ultimately, what has happened since then is that um, we haven't seen large numbers of um, incursions. We haven't seen destabilization on that border. We've seen some rocket attacks claimed by Islamic State to Khorasan province in May and June 2022, so last year. And then in the past six months, we've seen a number of border incursions that were claimed to have been foiled by the state security services. But I think, you know, in our understanding of extremism in the region, we are plagued by a, a paucity of sources and just believing the government's account um, at face, taking that at face value doesn't lead us to the correct conclusions, in my opinion. For example, the latest incursion that occurred around the time of Tajikistan's Independence Day, where the government claimed to have interdicted um, and prevented a terrorist attack by three individuals crossing the border in, a, in an area called Darvaz. Um, ultimately, an investigation of the photos that were released after that attack um, revealed that they were in fact from 2020, um, the amount of equipment that these three individuals had taken across the border was unfeasible, at least into, if they'd have brought it all over in one go. Um, and it was an attack that was blamed on, on a group called Jamwat Ansarullah that operates um, in the north of Afghanistan with close links to the Taliban and is led by um, uh, Tajik citizens. And so I think if we just take the government's accounts at face value, um, we would believe that there is a large threat of terrorism in the country. Um, but ultimately, a lot of these foiled plots, in fact, um, do not appear um, to be um, what the government claims them to be. And I think the Tajik digital ecosystem, the, 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 the messaging that exists on Telegram um, and on some other social media platforms, Instagram and others that targets Tajik uh, speaking individuals, is relatively developed when compared to other countries in the region, with the exception of Uzbekistan. But even this area that's been highlighted um, in various English language analysis, when you look at the number of people who are following these accounts, interacting with these accounts, you know, it's often numbering in the dozens. And so you know, the reach that we've seen these groups have has decreased. And I think, you know, to sum up, we're in a different position than we were a decade ago when we had thousands of individuals going to Syria and Iraq um, from Central Asia, many of them from the migrant communities in Russia. We had established recruitment networks um, that brought individuals from Central Asia or from Russia to Turkey and across that border. Uh, we had um, messaging and social media networks that were very accessible 
um, and people could easily access information, see videos related to what was going on in Syria and Iraq. And I think the situation has changed. You know, these networks have been largely blocked and disabled. These um, trafficking networks have also been um, uh, faced, uh, um, been closed down. We don't have a group in Afghanistan that can claim to be successful um, in the way that ISIS was historically. And so I think, you know, we've seen some individuals from Central Asia crossing that border um, into Afghanistan, but it's been a trickle, as Anna said, rather than the flow that we saw a decade ago. So I think the Tajik-Afghan border is an area um, that is, of course, of concern. Um, Tajikistan is a country that is concerned, but if we look at the record, um, the threat of terrorism and extremism um, appears in the longer term, I think in the entire region, um, to have been on the decline um, over the past few years. And I think events such as the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan um, has not dramatically altered that picture. But I will end there. Yeah, that was, I, I, I wanted to pick up on you on the, on the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, how, would, how do they view these groups now? Are they friends or enemies? Yeah, so I think there are a number of groups that recruit Central Asians um, to uh, amongst their members. I think one of the most active, as I said, in terms of Tajiks is Jamwat Ansarullah. It was founded or announced its existence in 2010. It was founded by a, a commander, a Tajik commander who fought in the civil war, who disagreed with the peace deal um, that was signed between the government and the opposition, relocated to Afghanistan. Um, and that's a group that has close relations with the Taliban. In fact, it's been charged by the Taliban to guard part of that border. Um, okay. But unlike the Taliban that has pledged its, um, its it pledged at least publicly that it would not expand north of the river that separates um, Afghanistan from the rest of Central Asia, Jamwat Ansarullah has made various videos and threats um, to Tajikistan. I think the other important group to talk about is Islamic State um, of Khorasan province that of course has existed um, for almost, I guess, just under a decade at this point um, as ISIS is well, Islamic State's branch in this part of the world in Afghanistan. Um, that group, obviously, unlike Jamwat Ansarullah, is opposed to the Taliban. A lot of its video and content in, in the Tajik language in these channels is critical of the Taliban. It's critical of the, their negotiations with the West. It views them as being non-Muslims, non-believers, and um, the, the true um, jihadist group, the ones who are struggling for the, for the Islamic community in their view is Islamic State. And so those, so one group allied with the Taliban or aligned with the Taliban, the other um, opposed to the Taliban. I mean, we've we'd been talking, I mean, everybody's talking <coughs> about Central Asia as a sort of um, cache of foreign fighters, as it's called. Uh, are, they, are they being exported out or were they being exported out, as you said, or, or what is the big threat within Central Asia itself for them to take over, over yeah. governments? No, I think it's important that, you know, I think that the terrorist threat as it's existed over the past decade, in fact, has manifested itself in other parts of the world, right? We had the, yeah. the most significant terrorist attack in New York since 9-11, back in um, 20, uh, must be late, late 2017, Halloween, in fact, 2017, so in fact, yes. we're on the anniversary today of that attack. Mm -hmm. um, and that was by an Uzbek migrant to the United States. That right. same year, we saw an attack in Istanbul, also by an, uh, an individual from Uzbekistan. We saw an attack in Stockholm. Um, and a slightly more questionable about attacking in the mm. in But Kinesburg. not attacking in the home country. And so we've seen some attacks in the home countries. I mean, my, my data collected between, I think, 2009 and, and 2018 saw about 18 attacks, if I'm not mistaken, within the region. But really, we've seen, we've seen more attacks, um, or, or we've seen more significant attacks outside of the region than within. And, and, and can, can, I, can I put to you, before, before I let you go, a question that I'd like all the panelists to think about, because I, from Anand Tomar, if the idealism behind radicalization remains strong, can Central Asian states continue? Uh, can Central Asian states continue to hold out against it? In, in fact, that's compounding my question to you just now. But uh, give us your thoughts on that, and I will be asking other members of the panel the same thing. Yeah, I think you know. I think as as we've picked up on, there is certainly there's a lot of the messaging from these groups um, is. Is, is one that is not necessarily negative. They're critical of the governments at home, of their corruption, of their crackdowns on religious freedom, but they're claiming to offer an alternative, an alternative that is more moral, that is more pure. Of course, we know that, that of course is not the case, but they are 
picking up on these grievances and trying to frame themselves as an area where they can provide they can provide a better alternative you know i think particularly a broader thing to monitor i think is uh, and you know, I'm seeing this particularly in Uzbekistan and some of the Uzbek language uh, social media that I've been tracking as part of a research project on, on extremism in the region is the Taliban, the Taliban's success, the Taliban's right. defeat of the West and the extent to which that galvanizes those who are pushing for uh, an adoption of similar styles of yeah. governance. Not necessarily violent extremists, those advocating for a violent overhaul of the Central Asian states, but those who are pushing for um, an um islam to play a greater role um in in politics and that's something you know as we're seeing societal islamization people taking a greater interest in in religion um we are seeing some of those voices coming up and i think that generates conflict not only with the governments but also with members of society who don't take those views um, um who are more secular to speak very simply so i think that's certainly something to watch Edward Lemon, thank you very much for that. We now move to Professor John Heathershaw at the University of Exeter. Uh, he's the founder of the Exeter Central Asian Studies. His current research looks at the global dimensions actually of money laundering and reputation laundering in the African and Eurasian elites. And he has studied for many years these issues that we are talking about in Central Asia. Uh, Professor John Heathershaw, give us your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Humphrey. I'll, I'll pick up where the conversation with Ed left off, really, which is that question about the nature of the problem in Central Asia itself. And maybe I'll begin with two observations. One is the very high level of repression by Central Asian governments to any public manifestations of anything remark at all political in the form of Islam. So I spent many years in the first decade of this century studying the Islamic Revival Party of Tajikistan, which was a party that um, had signed um, peace accords coming out of the civil war in the 1990s with the government and um, itself had no record of violence. It was a, a political body as a rather than a military body. But um, during the first decade it, of, this, of this century, it, it suffered increasing crackdown from the government and. A, was eventually banned in 2015, despite having, no, as I say, no record of violence. And uh, a second observation really is about the sort of terrorism talk with respect to Central Asia, an assumption that it has high levels of radicalization and therefore terrorism. And yet when we look at the data, we find it's very, very low levels of terrorism incidents in Central Asia itself. So, you know, less than 0.1% of all terrorist attacks globally take place in Central Asia. So what it seems that part of the problem here was a, a widely held misconception that sort of more pious and even more observant and, and actually more political Islam was all leading towards sort of a greater a, a problem of radicalization and, um, and terrorism. And at this time in the, in the first decade of, of this century that it seemed that the Western concern around counterterrorism meant that it was they were Western actors were prepared to work with uh, Central Asian governments to sort of counter this threat, this uh, largely, um, well, minimally existent threat, let's say. Um, and that, in a sense, had the problem of making the situation worse because it was partnering with those organizations that were, that were undertaking the repression. So in 2014, uh, David Montgomery and I wrote a Chatham House paper on this issue called the, I'm holding it up here because I thought I'd go back to it and, uh, and read it uh, when I was, received this invitation to speak today. And the paper was called The Myth of Post-Soviet Muslim Radicalization in the Central Asian Republics. And we were worried by this sort of failure to grasp the sort of realities on the ground in Central Asia. Thankfully, now due to research by scholars like Ed and Neil and Anna, a much more nuanced view has emerged. But I, I thought nearly 10 years on, it was worth going back to that paper and looking at the claims in the myth at the time, which were widely held by, by Western observers about Central Asia, uh, to see whether any of these claims have, have any plausibility to them at all and whether we need to sort of revisit them and rethink them today. So I'm just going to whiz through these six claims really quickly. First one that there is a post-Soviet Islamic revival, and that seemed like common sense. You know, the Soviet Union ended in 1991. There was a period of openness. Um, but in itself, that was quite a simplification because the reality was um, there was a, re a revival in a sense, which was state sanctioned 
in Central Asia from the 1940s when the Soviet Union uh, released quite a number of clerics from gulags and established an official state clergy and, and mosques. And so there's been multiple processes that have affected the development of Islam in Central Asia, um, really from back many, 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 many years. And it's, it's, I think it's overly simple to focus on that sort of post-Soviet movement and think about simply Islam being repressed before and uh, enabled afterwards. Secondly, there was the claim that if you are Islamizing, if you're becoming more Muslim in, in observant practice, then you're radicalizing. We saw terms like more strictly observant and sometimes radical Islam. So a, a conflation between these two things. This, this idea is that you know, violent extremist organizations are a thick end of a wedge, where at the thin end, we just see more softer versions of sort of political Islam. But actually, academic literature would see uh, Islamization, persons becoming more Muslim in their orthopraxy and their outward practice, and radicalization is really entirely distinct processes. You can't analyze them as, as sort of fundamentally intertwined or interrelated. Thirdly, there's this idea that authoritarianism and poverty cause radicalization. The problem with that is that there are many people who, well, everyone suffers under authoritarianism in Central Asia, and many people are poor. But a constant doesn't explain a divergence, explain a very small number of people who have who have been radicalized. And as we've seen, some of many of those who have gone to radicalization are actually quite well off. Um, fourthly, all us on the, it was said that all underground Muslim groups are radical. Uh, but in authoritarian contexts like this, all unorthodox groups of any kind avoid public attention. And again, a constant doesn't explain a divergence. It doesn't explain uh, why very small numbers may be drawn to, to radicalization. Fifthly, that political Islam necessarily opposes the secular state. But as I gave an example, the Islamic Revival Party of Tajikistan, which had, was an entirely pacified movement within the Tajik political system that fought elections, it was the reverse that was true. The secular state was cracking down on this party. And six radical Muslim groups are globally networked. Um, but in Central Asia, we found that many movements are pretty localized and uh, surveys have tended to show that there's very poor knowledge of some of the kind of key figures in political Islam globally and in recent history, people like Saeed Khatoum. Um, and there was certainly very few connections to Al Qaeda. Now, I think it's this last one where we might see a few reservations arise because of those foreign fighters that went out to ISIS that has been mentioned already. Um, and it's probably the only one that I would consider revising. Um, and this seems to be related to the huge effects of globalization on Central Asia and, and the patterns of migration. So those foreign fighters and those attacks in Stockholm, Istanbul, the United States that have been mentioned tends to be of individuals, there are very small number of individuals who are involved in these transnational patterns of migration. So what, what we're left with is still very low levels of radicalization and terrorism in Central Asia, very little reason to believe there's significant uh, political Islamic opposition of any kind, either legal or illegal, towards Central Asian regimes. And the puzzle is, how can we explain this occurring beyond the region, not within the region itself? And I think, plausible answers to that question have to be about these transnational pathways and processes of labor migrants, many of them quite young men in their 20s and 30s, becoming alienated, becoming detached from their communities back home, and then falling victim to the recruiters. And so that's where we need to go for our explanations, not lazy generalizations about uh, governments and societies in Central Asia itself. <laughs> this is fascinating to me. We, we have a region here that, 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 that used to be part of the Soviet Union. Um, and I think you're saying, in fact, I'll ask you a question from Philip Bowman that I think you've answered, but I'll give it, ask it straight. Is Islam the new nationalism in Central Asia? Uh, no, uh, nationalism is a new nationalism in Central Asia. Nationalism was strong in the late Soviet period and it's still strong. Um, Islam is, you know, it's it's very diverse, you know, there's many different manifestations of it within Central Asia. And yes, yeah, some of them are political, but but most are not. 
And then if, if we look back, say, at the Arab Spring and the Muslim Brotherhood coming to the fore in Egypt when, when that happened, to what extent would it have been the Soviet government in, those, in, 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 in Central Asia that might have ripped out so that Islam is not the new nationalism in Central Asia? Yeah, I mean, as I as I hinted at, you know, a certain kind of official state sanctioned Islam was 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 enabled in the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was a very effective system of surveillance and repression. Uh, some of those models and those practices of the security services has been continued by the post Soviet states and environments like that. It is quite hard for those kinds of Muslim Brotherhood type movements to emerge. And so if you are attracted to that kind of thing at all, then you're not likely to be able to do it in Central Asia. It's a basic question of political opportunity, and it's just not there. And there's not a lot of evidence, really, frankly, that it's emerging into any great degree. And OK, thank you very much. I, I would have a lot more to ask you, but we have to move on because I haven't said this before, but our democracy forum debates are uh, half an hour shorter than they used to be. We are now doing two a month, so we only have a barely half an hour left. So I want to finish up with uh, Dr. Thomas... F. Lynch from the Institute of National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. His latest book is Strategic Assessment 2020, the in Into a New Era of Great Power Competition. Uh, he also served 28 years on active duty with the U.S. Army in command of staff, co staff positions as the political military analyst, a special assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and military special assistant to U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan. When asked what he was going to talk about, he said the plans to focus on a theme of seeing Central Asia, think South Asia and China. I'm going to repeat that. Seeing Central Asia, thinking South Asia and China. Thomas Lynch, what does that mean and where does that lead us? Yes, Hello, Humphrey. Thank you for having me. And let me just uh, open by thanking uh, Lord Bruce and Minister Gardner uh, and the entire uh, Democracy for You team for inviting me to join you all today. Uh, I also must add here that uh, I am um, resident at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., uh, where I'm a distinguished research fellow, both teaching, writing, and working on projects for customers in our U.S. Department of Defense and our National Strategic Agency. However, what I'm about to talk to you on today, as I do with all of my talks and publications, is to uh, just let your audience know that what you're going to hear from me today does not necessarily represent the positions of uh, either the National Defense University, the the U.S. Department of Defense or the U.S. government. They are instead based upon my own research and conclusions. Um, now, as, as you mentioned, uh, Humphrey, um, my background and the reason I've kind of chosen the title for my presentation with you all here today, uh, which is, um, um, you know, uh, seeing Central Asia, uh, thinking uh, South Asia and China is uh, that, that I have looked for the last uh, over 25 years, both in U.S. Army military uniform and now uh, as a civilian researcher, you know, at the um, the international uh, terrorist milieu, uh, particularly as it focuses and, and catalyzes within uh, the regions uh, around Pakistan and Afghanistan, and, and my my views and travels uh, into Central Asia and looking at uh, terrorist activities there are really kind of through that lens and perspective. And as you mentioned, Humphrey, uh, some of my uh, other ongoing research kind of looks at the evolving nature of great power competition globally. Uh, and it's in that space that I wanted to offer a couple of observations uh, to your um, audience today, uh, just because I am uh, of the opinion that uh, perhaps my research can add value to the excellent commentary from the panelists already, uh, extending beyond perhaps what Edward Lemon has already talked about with Afghanistan and thinking about the kind of regional pressures on, you know, where uh, terrorism and radicalism may be heading in Central Asia and we, as we see major changes in the global terrorist milieu and in also the South and Central Asia and China surrounding the region. So with that kind of as a, as a framework and also a kind of a reference for your audience that my uh, most significant uh, open source publications on these topics are found uh, on the website for the National Defense University Press. Uh, and one is a monograph from late 2016 that 
looked at the issue of the return of foreign fighters to Central Asia and concluded, as most of the speakers today did, that there was uh, more concern than justified by the actual returning patterns that we saw in 2014, 15, and 16. Uh, second, I wrote uh, a monograph, again, available um, free of charge on the NDU Press website uh, in late 2022, talking about the structural factors that I believe are changing pretty significantly in South uh, Asia uh, and with respect to China's uh, uh, exposure and role in the uh, global terrorist milieu. And that coupled with changes in Afghanistan, uh, I would contend are going to shape uh, in the next several years, a, a different framework for Central Asia, uh, where its um, interactions and patterns uh, are going to be um, influenced by um, a, a new kind of focal point from the terrorist perspective and then also from China's role. So I'd offer you these three kind of perspectives. First, uh, subsequent to and even before the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan, there has been an evolving South Asia Muslim radical profile. Um, there's been more fragmentation, there's been more reorganization, there's been more recapture. And Central Asian terrorist groups, uh, given that they have been pretty effectively repressed for more than 20 years in Central Asia, uh, many in your audience will know, as do my fellow panelists, that uh, those fighters have uh, often um, grouped organized and arranged themselves in Afghanistan and Pakistan, affiliated with other inter international Salafi jihadist groups. Now, Syria became a very attractive place for a lot of these groups, and my fellow speakers have talked about that. I'm happy to take questions on it as well. Um, but um, these groups are still resident in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, they have affiliated over time with Al-Qaeda in the region. They've affiliated with Tariqi Taliban Pakistan in the region. They've affiliated with groups that have fragmented off of them. Uh, they've affiliated with the Taliban on occasion. And they've affiliated with uh, a group that Edward mentioned and that I'm going to focus on here in a second, which is the Islamic State of Khorasan province. Now, in each of these cases, the numbers have been small, uh, but as already indicated, the reputation of Central Asian fighters in the space of uh, terrorism and insurgency in uh, the Pakistan-Afghanistan region has been uh, a, a very um, uh, noteworthy one. They are seen as very dedicated, very committed, and very radicalized. Now, what's happened, I would argue to you, in the last uh, two to three years, and especially since the withdrawal of the United States, is the reorganization has continued within among these groups. And one of the key reorganizing factors uh, has been that the groups that are uh, oriented uh, against China and Chinese oppression of Muslim um, Uyghurs, um, where there has been a Uyghur presence for a long time uh, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, mixing and affiliating with Central Asian terrorists, but also extensively with global terrorist groups, under duress and pressure, mind you, from particularly the Pakistan military and then you know Chinese affiliated groups. Um, they they are now gaining what I would argue is an increasing voice in the South and Central Asia region. Indeed, uh, in 2015, Al-Qaeda announced uh, for the first time uh, that they had a special concern about the Uyghur persecution by the Chinese and they condemned the Chinese for that impact. Um, Al-Qaeda was highly affiliated with particularly this group called uh, the East Turkmenistan movement, uh, which is about trying to liberate Zhishang province. And as your audience will probably know and can look at a map to confirm, you know, the border with uh, the Uyghur province, uh, Shishang province, I should say, in China, uh, is most extensively with Central Asian countries. Um, and so that movement, particularly the group now that's reframed and reorganized itself as more of a political movement, but still has terrorist lineage and legacy, the uh, Turkestan I Islamic Party is affiliating and we see it mobilizing ever more prominently uh, in the uh, terrorism ecosphere in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So that is a change. And particularly, we see that even though the Taliban has had affiliations with these uh, Uyghur terrorist groups, uh, the Chinese are working hard, and I'll come back to them in a second, they're working hard to get the Taliban to uh, to, uh, to to muzzle and to, to, to suppress uh, these groups. And they've had some limited uh, activity in that space in the last year and a half or so that we track. Uh, but these groups, the Uyghur groups, are now affiliating ever more with the Islamic State of um, 
uh, Khorasan province, because that group is is encouraging and and championing terrorist actions uh, that are of a regional nature and that focus on gaining local traction. Uh, and, and this is also true because the Turkestan Islamic Party was uh, delisted uh, from the global terrorism list, uh, you know, with international agreement uh, back in uh, 2020 and 2021 as part of the process of delisting the Taliban and trying to disentangle that element there. Of course, the Chinese are not happy about that uh, and they have a role. Second, China. China, as I write in my 2022 um, a monograph, China is becoming ever more of a target of the uh, global terrorist Salafi jihadist movement. Uh, we see this happening across Afghanistan and Pakistan. The Pakistani military has been reasonably effective at suppressing a lot of that from erupting into, it, into the country, uh, but not perfect at it. Uh, and this fragmenting and reconfiguring of the, of the terrorist milieu is giving more space uh, to a, uh, a, an array of groups, including those that are targeting uh, establishing an independent uh, Muslim state in eastern China. That is worth watching because China is exposed in Pakistan. And even though Pakistan has dedicated more than 20,000 troops to protecting Chinese workers on the Belt and Road Initiative project there known as the uh, Central Crescent, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, there have been breakthroughs and there have been terrorist attacks. Likewise, in Afghanistan, we have seen the groups there um, try to influence recruiting from Tajikistan. And we think, as Edward mentioned, uh, my research at least uh, has, has uh, indicated that a couple of those um, uh, mortar strikes that Edward referred to in 2022 from northern Afghanistan to Tajikistan, while ineffective on the ground, were sort of effective in recruiting and propaganda to get uh, Muslims uh, to come into uh, Afghanistan and reaffiliate uh, with groups, to including those that are anti Chinese groups. And finally, and third, and implicit in my previous conversations is the, the uh, kind of blanket that was on uh, terrorist groups uh, for almost 20 years, which was the combination of the USA uh, in Afghanistan, um, the combination of Russia uh, having a real strong interest on the border uh, of uh, Central Asian states and, and, and and focusing troops and activities there uh, through the Central Treaty Security Organization, mostly the CTSO, um, and then Pakistan's reach to kind of suppress uh, uh, terrorist groups. Each of those three things have faded now. Even at the same time, China has become more exposed. You know, I don't mean to imply here that Pakistan's military is not a player in trying to suppress these groups. They are. But as we know right now, Pakistan is trying more and more to, to shove Afghan expats across its border back into Afghanistan so they don't have to deal with the repercussions of the terrorist groups on their side of the border. It can be um, Afghanistan's problem. China gets this, and we know they're trying to economically buy off and leverage the Afghan Taliban uh, to put pressure on these groups. It remains to be seen how effective that will be. And the U.S., we continue to work with selective terrorist strikes, uh, the most recent and spectacular against uh, Alman al-Zawahiri, uh, you know, uh, a summer and a half ago uh, in in um, in Tala in in correction in uh, uh, Kabul Afghanistan, but my point here is is that there is a lot less of a blanket kind of cooperative framework right now to suppress these groups and particularly the anti Chinese groups. So I think all this bears watching, and this is not to say that Central Asia is going to become a hot spot for these groups and activities. There is a very effective authoritarian state there that still works in most of these countries, and China, by the way, has really invested in technology, smart cities to help these groups repress and keep down the risks. But nonetheless, as the structure changes in the region, I'm hoping to alert your audience that it bears watching how this plays with the future of Central Asia as a corridor or a conduit for this kind of more energized anti-Chinese uh, global uh, terrorist network. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. It, it, it shifted the perspective because we think when you of Islamic terror as anti-American or anti-Israel. And now you're saying that here we've got to watch the Xinjiang issue and the anti-China element. I, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question that encapsulates from our audience. Then I'd like to go back around our panel uh, is in, in, the, in this Q&A and ask the same question to them to sort of sum up uh, extremism and radicalization in Central Asia. Is it getting better or worse? And where is it going? And you've helped us with a lot there. But uh, we've got a couple of questions from William Crawley. Um, 
How much is Muslim opinion in Central Asia focused on and affected by the Israel-Palestine conflict? And does the Kashmir conflict resonate with Central Asian governments or public opinion? I wonder if you could address those as briefly as possible, but also bring in these wider conflicts. Anil Batra says, how might the Iran-Saudi rivalry impact the rise of radicalization in Central Asia? Give us an encapsulating thought on that, uh, Tom Lynch, if you could. Uh, yes, Humphrey, and thanks for those questions. And I, I, I think a couple of the panelists here might be better positioned to talk about how things in Central Asia are perceived, because again, my lens is predominantly from South and Central Asia. But I'll say this in terms of the, you know, the kind of global terrorist milieu over time. I mean, each of these issues, um, Iran, Saudi, um, Kashmir, uh, and even the Israeli Palestine, they, they have some limited resonance in terms of exciting, you know, uh, angst and grievance within some of these, you know, Salafi jihadist movements. But I haven't seen them have particular local effects uh, on the ground in terms of either radicalization or stimulation. Al Qaeda, of course, would try to tap into these and build momentum. Um, ISIS Khorasan does a bit of that, but I mean, I think they're a little bit more um, uh, local and nuanced in what they're doing right now. So I just, I just don't see it. I mean, it, it's a backdrop, but it's not the prime grievance driver. Like I said, the grievance driver tends to be this feeling of persecution, of, of not having freedom to express religious activities, uh, and that gets oxygenated by, you know, a kind of, you know, um, uh, historical mythology about the caliphate that seems to be the thing that these groups then want to gravitate towards and fight to either establish locally, whether that be in Iraq and Syria for ISIS, you know, central or in Shishang province, if you're a Uyghur uh, and feel the oppression there is high. So it's kind of those local oppression grievances. And that's background noise, what's going on around the world. But it's really that focus area there that I think a lot of these recruitment groups focus on. Okay, that's that's right. John John Heathershaw, your thoughts on 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 the, the outside influences? Um, it's quite hard to say, but I think you know they do seem to be less felt in Central Asia than maybe other regions, obviously the Middle East itself, but other regions like North Africa and and South. Well, let's Asia. Felt, let's felt that in London, for example, where we've had these massive yeah, protests. I think that might be the case and you know one needs to think a little bit about how most central Asians in central asia would find out about this so they would typically do so through uh russian language global media russian television and that kind of thing which is mm. is filtered through a different optic it's it's quite hostile to israel but it's it's mainly just trying to justify russian domestic and foreign policy choices so you know, that that's going to be different than, you know, for Muslim populations that get their media through Al Jazeera Arabic, for example. Um, that's so I think those sort of things matter. And can I ask you a, a one word answer question um, at the top of our debate, extremism and radicalization in Central Asia getting better or worse? I think it's pretty static, to be honest. It's always been a very low level issue and it remains so within Central Asia itself. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Edward Lemon, uh, your thoughts on the outside influences, Kashmir, Israel, Palestine, China? Yeah, I think um, certainly the Israel-Palestine conflict is, is getting some attention. Um, I'm involved in a media monitoring project where we analyze um, digital messaging from various channels. And certainly, um, you know, it's, it's happened so recently. So recently, we haven't been able to do a detailed analysis. We have noticed certainly an uptick in discussion of the Israel-Palestine issue and everything that's going on in Gaza. We haven't seen, um, because of the political nature of these regimes, too many protests, um, one or two in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but certainly, it's it's going to be uh, a a factor, I think, in... Uh, in uh, or it's going to be used by by extremist organizations to try and um, and 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 do you you in agreement with Tom Lynch about watching closely on China and that's where the focus should be? Well, I think certainly um, China and, and certainly China's perception of this affects China's role in the region, which is perhaps a different conversation, right? There's no coincidence that its base, its only military facility in the region, is is near the Afghan Tajik. Um, and Chinese borders, because we know that they're very concerned about spillovers from Afghanistan and, and, and the penetration of Uyghur terrorists into Xinjiang and province. So I think it's certainly something that's of concern to China and yeah. um, 
is going to affect the region insofar as China is playing a greater role in Central Asian security. And, and that surveillance equipment that they're selling or giving, mm -hmm. of course, and, and extremism, radicalization in Central Asia getting better or worse? I would, I would say if we're taking a trajectory of the past decade and we look at where we were a decade ago, um, you know, I think the trajectory um, has um, been uh, a decline in the threat. Um, okay, John Heathershaw says it's static. You say it's declining. Emil Nazrit Dinoff, are you still with us on your road trip in Los Angeles? <laughs> we can see you. Um, give us your thoughts, if you can, on, on the outside influences, Iran, Saudi, Israel, Palestine, yeah. Kashmir. Yeah, so uh, outside influence, in my opinion, is uh, fairly minimal. Right? So uh, there's very little discussion, almost no discussion of what happened in uh, uh, Iran-Saudi relationship. Um, uh, Israel-Palestine has been receiving some attention, right? And there's like a small, but the only thing that we saw, right, was the small meeting organized by Muftiyat, for example, in Bishkek. Um, but what you see a lot on the ground is this request among people, okay, pray for Palestine, right? Um, um, the treatment of Uyghurs and Chinese, surprisingly, right, to my own surprise, uh, has received very little, um, has seen very little solidi solidarity among, uh, but at least Kyrgyz Muslim. Right? There was there were some protests, um, um, I think a couple of years back, in Kazakhstan, but um, it didn't go very far from there. So um, there is a general kind of uh, fairly high levels of xenophobia um, in Central Asia. But yeah, as I said, to my surprise, it, it didn't translate into and did not get amplified, you know, uh, because of the poor uh, treatment of Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang. As for the um, rates of radicalization, in my opinion, I am with Ed here, right? Uh, these are declining. And, um, and again, uh, back to my thesis, part, partially these are related to um, 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 uh, more religious freedoms uh, established by Mirzo Yaev, right, the new president of uh, Uzbekistan, right, and also uh, by um, uh, the, the, the change of presidency in Kazakhstan, right. Uh, Tajikistan still remains um, a very authoritarian and uh, very repressive uh, country towards Muslim uh, and sort of this still creates the high potential for radicalization but again if I this year I've traveled to Tashkent uh, I've traveled to Almaty several times what we observe right is that um, much much higher level of religious freedoms in Tashkent uh, more mosques are being built more people attending the mosques but uh, this is seen as a, an important social practice right uh, that also um, you know um, brings in peaceful Islam, forms of Islam. And as for Kazakhstan, it's becoming extremely, extremely secular, and um, it's moving actually away from uh, Islamization, in my opinion, um, and uh, in very different directions from uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and Anna Matviva, uh, can we finish with your, your very short thoughts on outside influences and Extremism and radicalization in Central Asia, is it static on decline or increasing? Mm -hmm. um, first, on um, international connections, of course, Gaza now is a hugely uh, relevant issue. Um, yes, we did not see a lot of uh, avert action uh, because of the nature of the states, uh, but a lot of discussion on kind of forum in kind of uh, chats, um, people kind of, it, it is very politicized environment. So it, it has kind of immediate um, resonance. Hopefully we're not going to see in Central Asia what we have seen in Dagestan and Russia, but uh, it does uh, uh, resonate, absolutely. Uh, yes, um, on our radicalization, I think there is no simple answer. One On one level, um, there is no kind of popular community large-scale support, which explains that there is community cooperation with the law enforcement and security apparatus, uh, because there is a lot of fear within society um, of that kind of um, movement. Um, also, the states have built pretty strong defensive, they are effective states. Um, they are also doing quite sophisticated 
um, work, for example, in Tajikistan, to their credit, they are the only state which offer forgiveness uh, to the former foreign terrorist fighters who came back and repent, and uh, they are uh, being um, let out and they live freely. Uh, all five Central Asian states uh, were the first to, to repatriate their citizens from the Middle East to their credit, despite not having a lot of money. Uh, the ambassador of Tajikistan was the only foreign ambassador. The first ambassador actually went to Alcohol. Uh, so they are doing yeah, a lot of things. Not on, Their responses are not only repressive. They are also working actively with the population. So although we might not like their methods, that, they, that doesn't mean that they are uh, fighting uh, or engaging with a kind of non -in, non-existent uh, okay. movement. Uh, in terms of you. future, I think that it, it, uh, radicalization is dormant. It now is taking a pause. It will come back. Generations changing ideas are there, and the motivations will be pushing these people into these ranks. Uh, whether they will become terrorists or not, that's another question. But Thank radicalization, you. I think, would be on the rise after. Thank you. Thank you. That is that is a, 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 a range of interesting views there. The generational change, of course, and now it is the time as we draw to the end of this democracy forum today to bring in the wisdom of our chair, Barry Gardner, uh, a veteran uh, of the British parliamentary democracy and of this region. Of course, Barry, what do you make of our discussion? Well, I'm afraid you're bringing in not so much wisdom, Humphrey, as confusion. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I've been listening very carefully to what our panelists have said. Uh, let me try and first of all recap and then try and pull out a few strands at the end. Lord Bruce very helpfully posed the question at the beginning about the primacy of religion over the allegiance to the state. Um, and he, he gave us a, a, a nice little um, uh, motto, uh, Terrorism does not arise from the radicalization of Islam, but the Islamization of radicalism. Um, I think that's what he said, uh, but pointed out that the revival of Islam was one of the factors in the demise of the USSR. Um, so is it possible that the terror threat has been exaggerated in order to magnify uh, or to, uh, to exert control? Um, now, Dr. Matveeva um, very helpfully started off by being quite categorical. She, she said, um, look, this is not just the poor who are recruited. Um, poverty as such is not directly related with, with terrorism. Um, often these are mature, settled family individuals. Um, I, I do wonder about this equation or this non-equation of poverty with with, uh, with um, uh, terrorism, because, of course, if one is talking about absolute poverty and where people are all the same, um, then that may well be true. But, of course, if there is um, relative poverty, and, of course, many countries do measure poverty in terms of relative poverty, then relative poverty can give rise to grievance. Uh, and I think it was important that she then went on to talk about aspiration levels now being stratospheric but unfulfilled and therefore if one can measure one's own situation against others then you see that relative poverty uh, and you you then have a, a cause and a source for grievance um, she talked about geopolitics and she talked about the psychological perception of grievance and injustice um, and uh, spoke about how uh, fighters, foreign fighters from, from the region were regarded as uh, the best warriors, the best uh, military technicians um, in Central Asia. How, how, she said, in Idlib, the, the Uzbeks' arrival turbocharged the conflict because they were seen as these, these amazing warriors. Um, and how the Tajiks comprised most of the suicide bombers, a, a sort of... Uh, a culture, uh, if you like, of, of uh, heroic or anti-heroic militarism. Um, now, Dr. Uh, Nasiritidinov uh, 
talked again about the demo degree of democracy in the five countries. Um, talking about Kyrgyzstan having the highest level of religious freedom. In, in effect, he approached the uh, the question from the other angle, from autocracy, but talked about it in terms of religious freedom. Um, again, though, he focused on this uh, research that's showing that the vulnerability to radicalization correlated to the perception of grievance. Um, he stated that religious freedom creates the space for other less radical groups. Uh, autocracy is intolerant of difference uh, and therefore radical extremism thrives under autocracy. Um, if there's no grievance, if you're free to practice religion, uh, then there is less radicalization. But he agreed with uh, Dr. Matveyeva that uh, poverty is not, at least absolute poverty, is not an important factor. So this emerging consensus that that there's something about autocracy here and, and that uh, imposed uh, state control um, that actually stimulates uh, terrorism and extremism. Dr. Lemon uh, talked about the geographical position, Tajikistan having the longest border with Afghanistan, but no mass destabilization of the country after the Taliban takeover, how the government has talked up a large threat from extremism. Uh, but he said most networks have been closed down. Um, groups accommodated to uh, the Taliban. Uh, the terrorist threat is around the world, not confined to the five states. Uh, and again, framing themselves as more moral, fighting injustice, again, this sense of, of, of grievance. Um, Professor Heathershaw talked about the high level of repression. Again, this business of autocracy against any religious body expressing political views, uh, less than 1% of attacks in the five countries. And he spoke of the way in which Western countries had partnered with governments uh, in, in terms of repression. And he, he made the, the five claims about uh, the post-Soviet Islamic revival being an overly simple uh, view stricter Islam and extremism, poverty and autocracy, political Islam going against uh, the, the secular state and so on. Um, he talked about the impact of globalization and patterns of migration and the alienation of young people uh, uh, against government. And of course, Dr. Lynch, uh, seeing Central Asia thinking South Asia moved, as you said, Humphrey, the, the, the focus uh, onto, onto China, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, noticing against, uh, issuing that notice against China over the Uyghurs, uh, the Turkestan Islamic Party and the Islamic State of uh, Khorasan province. Um, so let's, let's try and pick out threads. Grievance, persecution, authoritarianism. Now, I go back in, 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 in British history, our most autocratic king was probably Henry VII, um, exerting control after the civil war, um, which he won at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. But he actually was our most autocratic king, and he imposed a reign of terror on the population. And I think there is something about the way in which um, if terror is coming from the top, if autocracy and, and, and central control is so severe, then it actually teaches people who want to uh, exert themselves against that uh, the way to do it. And, and it was interesting that two generations later, you got the very opposite in, certainly for its era, in Queen Elizabeth I, saying that she didn't want to make a window into men's souls. Um, and of course, you have the United States of America founded on the principle of being the free and the brave, collecting the, 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 uh, the people who didn't fit in to the religious autocracy of their countries, uh, going to set up this new nation. So what I thought was really significant is that each of our panelists talked about the very few numbers of, of, of terrorism in, in the these states themselves. I think Professor Heather Shaw said less than 1% of attacks. Somebody else said 18 attacks. Um, in the United States last year, 
there were 647 terror attacks, mass shootings. In 2021, there were 690. Um, I, I think we need to bring the question of terrorism much closer to home. We need to understand what's going wrong in our society, um, as well as around the world, and prompting not just uh, religious fundamentalist terror, but this extraordinary explosion of violence meted against innocent civilians um, in our countries. And that, I think, has to take us back into um, an anthropological view of, of the way in which we as a species operate and, and which young men exert their, uh, their testosterone. It, it was interesting, I thought, when uh, Dr. Mateva was, was talking about mature, settled family individuals, but actually, I think she was predominantly talking about men, and, and women with children tend not to be uh, the terrorist fighters. Um, there are exceptions, certainly, and certainly some women have been attracted to go off and become part of the uh, these groups, the, the terrorist groups and ISIS and so on, um, attracted by whatever glamour they, they appear to have to them. Um, but I do think fundamentally we come back to the problem of young men feeling that they have not got the voice in their society that they wish, perceiving grievance, needing to exert themselves, as indeed in so many species, this happens. And human beings often think that we're an exception to the animal kingdom. I don't think we are. And I think the fact that we're, uh, we think of ourselves as an exception means that we are less able to manage what actually is uh, an inbuilt anthropological response. I'll leave it there. Barry, thank you for those final thoughts that takes us into a whole different area which we should have a democracy forum uh, debate on. Uh, and thank you panelists uh, on, on focusing us on Central Asia. Uh, Anna Matviva, Emil Nazardinov, uh, who is on a Los Angeles, <laughs> Californian road trip, Edward Lemon, John Heathershaw, and Thomas F. Lynch. Uh, Lord Charles Bruce for giving us a platform from which to debate and to our audience for your questions and comments which really drove the debate on. Our next Democracy Forum debate is at two o'clock London time on November the 14th, jamaat e islami Bangladesh, the subcontinental brotherhood. Uh, we then have one on Wednesday, November the 29th, uh, at two o'clock again, why China's Belt and Road Initiative has failed to take off in Nepal. And then again on December the 13th, again at two o'clock, back to our theme here, Central Asia and China, a new dependency. Uh, that was what uh, we learnt here, how that was switching towards China. Uh, read our sister magazine, Asian Affairs, that drills down more on the issues that we debate, covering stories, a lot of stories and a lot of detail that you will not see in the mainstream media. But until November the 14th, from me, Humphrey Hawksley, and all at Democracy Forum, thank you and goodbye.